Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. 2020, we provide pro-life Catholic analysis of this week's Republican National Convention, its platform, and the Trump-Pence campaign. Racism and hypocrisy, a new bombshell report alleges major pro-abortion groups like Planned Parenthood and NARAL have been practicing racism within their ranks. We speak out, and life is winning. Pro-life leader Marjorie Dannenfelser releases a new book this week and shares a close-up look of her personal pro-life journey. We are dedicating this week's show to pro-life analysis of the 2020 Republican National Convention. President Donald Trump formally accepts his re-nomination for a second term as the Republican presidential nominee. At the RNC convention this week, the Trump campaign prominently touted their pro-life personnel and policies. Policies that force jobs to flee our country or allow abortion up until the point of birth are not nice. The Republican National Convention, while largely virtual, was held in Charlotte, North Carolina this week, and organizers made sure to set the GOP party apart from Democrats on the life issue. My name is Abby Johnson, and I spent eight years working for Planned Parenthood, but today I'm a pro-life activist. Prominent pro-life leader Abby Johnson spoke Tuesday evening in what was seen as an effort to galvanize the grassroots pro-life vote from a national platform. The former Planned Parenthood director, who converted to the pro-life cause and the Catholic faith, exposed in some graphic detail the time she witnessed an abortion at Planned Parenthood. Nothing prepared me for what I saw on the screen. An unborn baby fighting back, desperate to move away from the suction. And I'll never forget what the doctor said next. Beam me up, Scotty. Tuesday evening also included a speech from pro-life teen Nicholas Sandman, the former Covington Catholic student who was at the center of a national controversy following the 2019 March for Life. In 2019, I attended the March for Life in Washington, D.C., where I demonstrated in defense of the unborn. Assisted suicide was also condemned in a powerful way this week when on Monday, California resident Natalie Harp took to the podium. Diagnosed with a rare terminal bone cancer, Harp emotionally denounced doctor-prescribed assisted suicide. I was told I was a burden to my family and to my country, and that by choosing to die early, I'd actually be saving the lives of others by preserving resources for them rather than wasting them on a lost cause like myself. The pro-life issue is likely to be an ongoing theme in the Trump-Pence campaign. The administration has made significant pro-life achievements, which includes expanding the Mexico City policy, creating an office for conscience protection at the HHS department, enacting the Protect Life rule, and President Trump even became the first sitting president to attend the annual March for Life. Young people are the heart of the March for Life, and it's your generation that is making America the pro-family, pro-life nation. Every child is a precious and sacred gift from God. But pro-lifers say there's still more to be done. In September 2016, then-Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump wrote a letter to the pro-life leaders with four commitments. He promised, if elected, he would be committed to nominating pro-life justices to the Supreme Court, signing the Paying Capable Unborn Child Protection Act into law, defunding Planned Parenthood as long as they continue to perform abortions, and to make the Hyde Amendment permanent law. While Trump's Supreme Court nominees, Justices Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh, received the support of top pro-life groups, the other promises have not been fulfilled. Trump's Protect Life rule does strip Title X funds away from Planned Parenthood, which totals about $60 million a year. But Planned Parenthood's federal funding of about half a billion dollars annually has only gone up. 
Cassie Smedley is the Deputy Communications Director for the Republican National Committee. She also happens to be Catholic and joins us now via Skype from the RNC studio. Welcome to the show. How much did the RNC want to emphasize the pro-life issue in the 2020 convention this week? Well, it's certainly a priority issue for um, our voters, for our supporters, but I think for Americans, especially as you've seen the Democrats not just acquiesce to, to a pro-choice platform, but really a pro-abortion platform, making it mainstream to advocate for abortions up to the moment of birth and even some after that. And you have Joe Biden, who has backtracked on his long-held support for the Hyde Amendment. He says he now is okay with taxpayer-funded abortions. You also, and in the same breath, you mentioned I'm a Catholic. Um, Joe Biden proclaims to be a Catholic, and yet now he is out there happy to tout the um, radical, the Democrats' radical views on abortion. And that's um, something that every Catholic needs to know, because as we well know, you cannot be a Catholic if you espouse these radical viewpoints, um, on anti-life viewpoints on abortion. Prominent pro-life speaker Abby Johnson spoke at the RNC convention Tuesday night. Can you tell us about how that came together and why the RNC wanted to incorporate her specific message? Yeah, so I have to give my hats off to the, the president and his team with our RNC team and our state parties who have worked to find these real voices and to make sure that this convention does emphasize so many real Americans doing extraordinary things in their lives, many of them because they feel empowered by the Trump-Pence administration and Republicans. And so there was a real emphasis um, to make sure that all of these great Americans had a, a prime time spot, literally. And Abby Johnson was an incredibly harrowing testimonial. And I don't know that we've seen that level of a testimonial, that level of a depiction of an abortion in prime time. And I know that was uncomfortable for many people, but for those of us in the pro-life movement, we know that's the reality. We know that the left tries to glamorize this horrific industry. And to he have people hear that in prime time was really important. And I think it's, um, it was a fantastic decision by the president and our chairwoman to make sure that that got the rightful place that it deserved. Um, because the left, like I mentioned, is trying to say that we are making this up, that we are making it out to be more than what it is, that Planned Parenthood is just trying to offer health care to women. And to hear her say that she had her quota doubled for how many abortions her, um, her specific uh, office was supposed to provide, I mean, that, that just was nauseating. And that's what the left doesn't want you to hear. Mm. And that's what when Joe Biden says that he's a Catholic, that that's why that flies in the face of that, that statement, because how can you be a Catholic and support this industry, which he has um, mm. added his support for? Cassie, this week the Trump campaign announced the president's second term agenda under health care. The campaign outlined important agenda items from cutting prescription drug prices to covering all pre-existing conditions, but abortion was not explicitly mentioned. Can you speak to why that is and whether or not that pro-life issue will be prioritized if President Trump does have a second term? I well, certainly can't speak to the policy decisions of the White House or even the legislative branch, but I have a feeling that if we were able to knock Nancy Pelosi off the speaker podium, we were able to get the House back so that we had strong conservative Republicans who were in the majority in the House and the Senate, that would offer a great opportunity for pro-life legislation to continue to be a priority for the president and for the Republicans and for America's representative body. So that I think those things can come when we make sure that we have the votes we need. I think the president was outlining what he thought he could do that was attainable right in the moment with the circumstances that we have, because you know, with this uh, House Democrats in the majority, we're no longer talking about people who are just left of center on an issue. These people are all the way far left out the building, down the street, and around the corner. They are radicals. And so we've got to make sure that we are getting the right people in Congress to help propel the administration's priorities, which, as we know, are the vast majority of Americans' priorities. The vast majority of Americans fundamentally disagree with the left's radical position on abortion. And Cassie, the RNC did not release a new party platform this year and opted to leave in place the one from 2016. And the 2016 RNC platform was seen as very strongly pro-life on the abortion issue. But is the RNC concerned that by not updating the platform, it will not be able to address current pro-life challenges and new pro-abortion laws? 
So we made the decision not to mess with the platform to continue to use that document from 16 as our founding principles document because of coronavirus. We didn't think it was fair that such a small percentage of our governing body could be part of um, could write the platform for everyone. So that makes a lot of sense to those of us who are having to deal with things, doing things a little bit differently. But rest assured, we have the most pro-life president, certainly in my lifetime, some would say in the history of our country. And the underlying principle of this party is that we are pro-life. And we have a president who fights for that and stands up for pro-life. We are the pro-life generation. He hears that, as you mentioned, the first sitting president to attend the March for Life. So this is a priority for the administration. It's a priority for our party. And we will continue to be vocal fighters and champions for life. Cassie Smedley with the Republican National Committee. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Joining us now via Skype for pro-life analysis of this week's RNC convention and the Trump-Pence campaign is Marjorie Dannenfelser. She is president of the Susan B. Anthony List and author of the new book, Life is Winning. We're also joined by Dr. Chad Pecknold, a theology professor at the Catholic University of America, who frequently writes about the church and politics and the American culture. Thank you both for being here. Marjorie, former Planned Parenthood director Abby Johnson's speech at the RNC convention is getting a lot of pro-life attention. What was your reaction to that moment? Well, the thing I'm most excited about is it's getting national attention. Uh, beyond the choir, it is reaching people that, who perhaps have not heard this message before. That struck me definitely. It was profound. It talked about the uh, how the child recoils from the implements that are inserted to, um, to kill the child. And also, I was excited about the fact that this is a very different time. Life, it really is winning in America. The last, uh, the last Republican convention, there was nothing like this um, level of support for life. And this Democratic convention just recently hardly mentioned the abortion issue at all. So it's a flip script from Democrats to Republicans. Mm. Republicans used to bury it, they don't anymore. Democrats used to highlight it, and now they're trying to bury it. That's the right direction. That's a fascinating insight. Chad, as a Catholic theologian, did anything stand out to you at this convention, particularly when it comes to the sanctity of life? Yeah, you know, I, I noticed on the first night there was some who criticized the convention for not stressing abortion enough, but that was quickly wiped out uh, the second night. I, I think I think it's I think obvious that this is a party, this is a convention that is a human dignity convention, a convention that, that actually does believe that life is winning and that we should ensure that life wins. And I think that that's clearly on display. I think that is in great contrast to democratic cities uh, which are tearing apart uh, human life, which are burning down people's places of work. and which are tearing down children in the womb in their Planned Parenthood clinics. These, these, are the, these are the contrasts that we're living with in America right now, and the convention is really putting a, a light on that. Marjorie, there is no updated RNC platform for 2020, and the 2016 platform will stay in place. That platform had been called the most pro-life platform, but is it able to address pro-life concerns and challenges we have today in 2020? Well, I think without question, I mean, the platform certainly has a purpose. It, it, is the, it is the declaration of principles that a party stands for, important. And it was and is the most pro-life that has ever been. What is most important is how those, work, how those principles work out operationally. This president and this vice president and his whole administration, and now governors and state legislators across the country are operationally pro-life, not just spoken principle, but action. And that is what is needed to win the human rights uh, movement of our time. And that is happening right now. In September of 2016, then presidential nominee Donald Trump wrote a letter to the pro-life coalition and he made four pro-life commitments. He promised if elected, he would be committed to nominating pro-life justices to the Supreme Court, signing the Paying Capable Unborn Child Protection Act into law, defunding Planned Parenthood as long as they continue to perform abortions and to make the Hyde Amendment permanent law. Marjorie, President Trump has nominated Justices Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, who both have the support of your group. But where are we with these other pro-life commitments? Well, where we are is, um, is that there is a responsibility that this Congress has had 
to present legislation for this president to sign that it has not done. There are only certain things that can be done through executive order. Now, I'm in really close conversation with the, with the president, the vice president, the chief of staff, and other people at the White House about is there anything else that we can do? There are a lot of ra rather complicated things that are take more time than we have now, but I really do believe that there's there's hope even beyond what we've done before when it comes to uh, defunding Planned Parenthood and reallocating those resources. The other piece, the signing into, into law of the 20-week pain, pain, pain capable bill could not surmount the filibuster. Two thirds in the Senate is a very high bar. Now the Democrats are promising to undo that, to have a, in the legislative filibuster so that they can do whatever they want if the Senate comes into Democratic hands. So that would be a flip problem that we would have. But this president has done every single thing possible, along with the help of his vice president, in fulfilling all of those promises, especially the judges. Chad, what have you made of President Trump's last four years on the life issue, and what would you like to see moving forward? Well, obviously, many of us in the pro-life movement are very pleased about uh, rolling $60 million out of uh, the Planned Parenthood's budget. That was a really good start. And, of course, the appointment of pro-life judges is uh, very, very welcome. But I, I share some of Marjorie's concerns about legislative um, gridlock. And moving forward, I'd love to see some of the ideas that, that have that have been proposed. The idea that I support and, and I would love to see the president pursue is the Lincoln proposal, which is to exercise the take care duty of Article II and to use executive power to include the unborn under the 14th Amendment, to give them protection under law. Uh, and that would have binding effect within the executive branch. Uh, it would be contested, um, but it would and could be used to pressure states, to use mm -hmm. federal law enforcement uh, on abortion clinics, using DHS or some other authority. This is exactly mm -hmm. what Lincoln did to overturn Dred Scott. I think it's the only uh, bold proposal uh, that I've heard that I think is the president's capable of. He's capable of making a bold uh, Lincoln move here, and I hope he does so. Marjorie, I know you said you were in close talks with the administration right now. Do you expect President Trump to renew those four pro-life commitments or release a letter with new pro-life promises? Well, I think uh, tomorrow night um, we'll all be watching. I'll be there at the White House watching his speech as well. And I think we've been and we've been promised some pretty awesome things uh, surrounding that speech and um, and from himself. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think there are uh, some. It surprises meaning nothing I don't know about um, the the Lincoln proposal, but things that I think that will be galvanizing to the country and that will help provide a contrast between this ticket and the other, where we absolutely know what the Biden-Harris uh, ticket is, is going to provide. I just wanted to comment on one thing, too, and that is that beautiful connection that you made, Professor, between what's going on in the country and now the, the uh, interconnectedness of human rights and the meaning of human dignity everywhere is what binds this time and helps highlight what's going on that's beautiful and what's not. Also, thinking about this historically, where the human rights battles have been won and how they're all connected to this particular battle. Mm. Uh, and I believe that, that is the president that we have. That's how he sees it, along with uh, Vice President Pence. Thank you both for your excellent insight. Marjorie Dannenfelser and Dr. Chad Pecknold, thank you both. And Marjorie, stick around because we'll be talking to you about your new book. The Catholic Church teaches that each and every human life is sacred from the moment of conception until a natural death. That's a fundamental belief we as Catholics carry with us from inside our church walls to outside in the public square. And as election day draws closer, we need to make sure we are first and foremost informing our consciences on the issue of life. We should be rereading the catechism, papal encyclicals on life, and even reviewing the EWTN's voter's guide. That way, when we get to the ballot box in November, we can make a well-informed and prayerful decision. And that brings us to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and sign our pledge that you will vote pro-life. By signing this pledge, we can keep each other accountable to prioritize life at the ballot box. In these next few months leading up to November, let's all take steps to inform our conscience on life, 
pray, and discern our decision for our vote. It is crucial to have state lawmakers and national leaders who respect the dignity of all human life. Life is sacred and a fundamental right. Again, as we prepare for Election Day, sign the pledge that you will vote with life in mind. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Coming up, a new bombshell report includes serious allegations against Planned Parenthood and other major pro-abortion groups. I speak out against Planned Parenthood's disregard for human dignity as they once again face allegations of racism toward their own employees. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. Major pro-abortion groups are once again facing allegations of racism towards their own employees. That is this week's Speak Out segment. BuzzFeed News reported this week employees of Planned Parenthood, NARAL, and other pro-abortion groups said they were subject to, quote, toxic work environments for employees of color. The former employees told BuzzFeed they were the subject of racist comments or were denied opportunities for advancement that their white colleagues received. A former employee at Planned Parenthood's Washington, D.C. affiliate told BuzzFeed, quote, I've worked at plenty of nonprofits and I've never been treated so horribly in my life as I was at Planned Parenthood, to the point where I grew very depressed, had a lot of anxiety and cried in the bathroom almost every day. In one resignation letter obtained by BuzzFeed News, a former Planned Parenthood of Western Pennsylvania employee said the abortion business does not practice what it preaches, writing, quote, an unsafe environment has been created here, one where management is comfortable and unaccountable while employees suffer and go unheard. The report comes after the CEO of Planned Parenthood of Greater New York, was just ousted in June after facing allegations of racism and mismanagement in public letters written by staff members. This is not the first time Planned Parenthood and other pro-abortion groups have faced allegations of racism from within, and yet they never seem to change. Planned Parenthood recently announced it would remove the name of its founder, Margaret Sanger, from its Manhattan facility, citing her racist legacy. It is obvious that legacy lives on within the organization itself today. An organization committed to abortion cannot be trusted to look out for the dignity of any human beings. Unfortunately, that also includes its own employees. For this week's Pro-Life Focus, a top pro-life leader and regular guest on our show has just released a new book. This week, Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List and frequent face here at EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, has released Life is Winning. The book tells the story of how the pro-life cause went from an orphaned political problem to a winning issue. Former White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders wrote the book's foreword, and there's an introduction by Vice President Mike Pence. Dan Felser helped to start the Susan B. Anthony list back in the 1990s and has been advising top political leaders on the life issue for two decades now. Marjorie Dan Felser is back with us on the show via Skype to discuss her new book, Life is Winning. Marjorie, congratulations on your book's release. You tackle how abortion was previously viewed as a political problem, but today you say being pro-life is a winning strategy. In a summary, what changed? What changed was being bold and proud of the position that we hold, highlighting the child, him or herself, and the mother who carries him or her, really focusing on the beauty of our message and not putting it in a closet, but being very open and honest and taking this conversation to a national level through the people that we elect for public office. Mm. And when that happens, when that national level conversation occurs, our argument is compelling, it's, it's loving, loving, it sways people, and it convinces them that the horror that they didn't know was true really is true, that abortion in this nation under our judges and under the Supreme Court is, is um, legal up until birth. Um, so mm -hmm. two things happened. Uh, people knew what, knew was, what happening. was happening, and because uh, candidates and elected officials started to become very proud of this, um, they uh, they helped build consensus for life in America. But the only way to do that, and I know you know this, Catherine, the only way to do that is to support those candidates, people like Trump and Pence and senators and legislators across the country 
support them, flex that muscle of a very strong pro-life movement, put your efforts mm -hmm. behind them. And when they do well, praise them and continue to help. When they do poorly, you do everything you can to defeat mm -hmm. them and help them get it back into the private sector where perhaps they should have stayed in the first place. Marjorie, you really, in this book, pull back the curtains on the politics of the pro-life movement. Your book outlines multiple political battles you had to fight on behalf of the unborn. Are you ever disenchanted or disheartened by how political and divisive the issue of abortion is and this political sphere of the pro-life movement? No, I'm, I'm really honestly not. You know, I, I can't say that there have been points there I was, uh, uh, that I wasn't disappointed, yes, because you believe in people and they disappoint you all the time in every sphere of life. Yeah. And even in a, in a area where this is so important and where you can't imagine somebody saying they're pro-life and then not acting that way. But that to me is the way, it's the zigzag path of any successful human rights movement in this nation. And if you look back at all of them, the history is studded with different, um, different approaches, uh, people who failed, people who did well, people who didn't see the full horror of the human rights abuse at that time. And it really took the, the regular people, the people who were, um, who were electing and unelecting to make a big difference. I also never see politics as separate from culture. Mm. It's very much at the center. It's the aspect where we can raise issues to the national level, along with other institutions, and talk them out, contrast the views. Mm -hmm. And when we know that this gets to the national level, we win, and we are. Well, I could talk to you for so much longer about this book, Life is Winning. It includes your personal conversion story, both to the pro-life movement and to the Catholic faith. Again, congratulations, Marjorie Dannon Felser, author of Life is Winning. Thank you. Thank you. And that does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also email us at EWTN at ProLifeWeekly at EWTN.com. We'd love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.